To her master, nay father, to her husband, nay brother, his handmaid, nay daughter, his spouse, nay sister, to Abelard, Eloise. Your letter, written to a friend for his comfort, beloved, was lately brought to me by chance. Seeing at once from the title that it was yours, I began the more ardently to read it in that the writer was so dear to me that I might at least be refreshed by his words as by a picture of him whose presence I have lost. These things I deem that no one can read or hear with dry eyes, for they renewed in fuller measure my griefs. So diligently did they express each several part and increased them the more in that thou relatedst that thy perils are still growing so that we are all alike and throbbing bosoms await the latest rumor of thy death. And so, in his name, who still protects thee in a certain measure for himself, in the name of Christ, as his handmaids and thine, we beseech thee to deign to inform us by frequent letters of those shipwrecks in which thou art still tossed, that thou mayst have us at least, who alone have remained to thee, as partners of thy grief or joy and to say nothing of the rest. Think by what a debt thou art bound to me, that what thou owest to the community of devoted women, thou mayest pay more devotedly to her who is thine alone. Thou knowest, dearest, all men know what I have lost in thee, and in how wretched a case that supreme and notorious betrayal took me myself also from me with thee, and that my grief is immeasurably greater from the manner in which I lost thee than from the loss of thee. And strange it is to relate, to such madness did my love turn, that what alone it sought, it cast from itself without hope of recovery, when, straightway obeying thy command, I changed both my habit and my heart, that I might show thee to be the one possessor both of my body and of my mind. Who among kings or philosophers could equal thee in fame? What kingdom or city or village did not burn to see thee? Who, I ask, did not hasten to gaze upon thee when thou appearedst in public? nor on thy departure with straining neck and fixed eye follow thee. What wife, what maiden did not yearn for thee in thine absence, nor burn in thy presence? What queen or powerful lady did not envy me my joys and my bed? There were two things, I confess, in thee especially, wherewith thou couldst at once captivate the heart of any woman, namely, the art of making songs and of singing them, which we know that other philosophers have seldom followed, wherewith as with a game, refreshing the labor of philosophic exercise, thou hast left many songs composed in amatory measure or rhythm, which for the suavity both of words and of tune being oft repeated, have kept thy name without ceasing on the lips of all, since even illiterates the sweetness of thy melodies did not allow to forget thee. It was on this account, chiefly, that women sighed for love of thee. And as the greater part of thy songs discanted of our love, they spread my fame in a short time through many lands and inflamed the jealousy of many women against me. For what excellence of mind or body did not adorn thy youth? What woman who envied me then does not my calamity now compel to pity one deprived of such delights? What man or woman, albeit an enemy at first, is not now softened by the compassion due to me? Give thy attention, I beseech thee, to what I demand, and thou wilt see this to be a small matter and most easy for thee. 
While I am cheated of thy presence, at least by written words, whereof thou hast an abundance, present to me the sweetness of thine image. Remember, I beseech thee, what I have done, and pay heed to what thou owest me. I have forbidden myself all pleasures that I might obey thy will. I have reserved nothing for myself save this to be now entirely thine. Consider, therefore, how great is thine injustice, if to me who deserve more thou payest less, nay, nothing at all, especially when it is a small thing that is demanded of thee, and right easy for thee to perform. When in time past thou sortest me out for temporal pleasures, thou visitest me with endless letters, and by frequent songs did set thy Eloise on the lips of all men, with me every public place, each house resounded. How more rightly shouldst thou excite me now towards God, whom thou excitest then to desire. Consider, I beseech thee, what thou owest me. Pay heed to what I demand. And my long letter, with a brief ending, I conclude. Farewell. My all. To her all after Christ, his all in Christ. I marvel, my all, that whereas thou shouldst have brought us the remedy of comfort, thou hast increased our desolation and hast provoked tears which thou shouldst have dried. For who among us could hear with dry eyes what thou hast put towards the end of thy letter, saying, If the Lord should deliver me into the hands of mine enemies, so that they prevail over me and slay me and the rest. O oh, dearest, with what mind didst thou think that? With what lips couldst thou endure to say it? Never may God so forget his handmaids as to keep them to survive thee. Never may he concede that life to us which is harder to bear than any kind of death. It is for thee to celebrate our obsequies, for thee to commend our souls to God and those whom thou hast gathered together for God to send first to him, that thou be no more disturbed by anxiety for them and so much the more joyfully to follow us, the more assured thou already be of our salvation. Spare, I beseech thee, Master, spare us words of this sort, whereby thou makest wretched women most wretched and take not from us before our death that which is our life. With thee lost what hope remains to me, or what reason for remaining in this pilgrimage when I may have no remedy save thee, nor aught else in thee save this, that thou art alive, all other pleasure from thee being forbidden me, to whom it is not allowed even to enjoy thy presence, that at times I might be restored to myself. Oh, if it be right to say so cruel to me in all things, God. O oh, inclement clemency. O oh, fortune unfortunate, which has already so spent all the arrows of its whole strength on me that it has now none wherewith to assail others. It has emptied its full quivers on me so that vainly do others now fear its onslaughts. Nor, if any arrow still remain to it, would it find in me a spot to wound. One thing amidst so many wounds it has feared, lest I end my torment by death. All the rights of equity are equally turned against me, for while anxiously we enjoyed the delights of love, divine severity spared us. But when we corrected the unlawful with the lawful and covered the vileness of fornication with the honesty of marriage, the wrath of the Lord vehemently increased the weight of his hand upon us, nor did he allow an immaculate couch who had long endured one polluted. For men taken in the most flagrant adultery, that would have been sufficient punishment which thou didst suffer. What others might merit by adultery, thou didst incur by a marriage, whereby thou thoughtest that thou hadst given satisfaction for all thy wrongdoing. What adulteresses bring to their lovers, thine own wife brought to thee and not while we were indulging still in our old pleasures. But when, already separated for a time, we were living chastely, 
thou indeed presiding over thy school in Paris, and I at thy command, dwelling at Argenteuil among the nuns. For when we were thus divided, that thou the more studiously mightest devote thyself to thy school, either more freely to prayer or the meditation of holy books, while we were living thus, as in greater holiness, so in greater chastity, thou alone didst pay in thy body the penalty for what we both alike had committed. Alone wert thou in the punishment, too are we in the fault, and thou who wert the less guilty hast borne all. For inasmuch as thou hadst given fuller satisfaction by humiliating thyself for me, and hadst exalted me and all my race alike, so thou hadst given less cause for punishment both to God and to those traitors. Unhappy that I am born to be the cause of so great a crime. O oh, constant bane of women greatest against the greatest men, wherefore is it written in the Proverbs to beware of women? Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Oh, that I may have the strength to do fit penance for this fault, especially that I may be able in some measure to recompense by the long contrition of penitence that punishment of the wound inflicted on thee and what thou to the present hour hast borne in thy body. May I, all my life long as is right, take upon my mind, and in this way satisfy thee at least, if not God. For if I am truly to set forth the infirmity of my most wretched heart, I find no penance wherewith I may appease God, whom always for that outrage I charge with the utmost cruelty and refractory to his dispensation, offend him rather by my indignation than appease him by my repentance. For what repentance of sins is that, however great the mortification of the body, when the mind still retains the same will to sin and burns with its old desires? So sweet to me were those delights of lovers which we enjoyed in common that they cannot either displease me nor hardly pass from my memory. Whithersoever I turn, always they bring themselves before my eyes with the desire for them. Nor even when I am asleep do they spare me their illusions. In the very solemnities of the mass when prayer ought to be more pure, the obscure phantoms of those delights so thoroughly captivate my wretched soul to themselves that I pay heed to their vileness rather than to my prayers. And when I ought to lament for that which I have done, I sigh rather for what I have had to forego. Not only the things that we did, but the places also, and the times in which we did them are so fixed with thee in my mind, that in the same times and places I reenact them all with thee, nor even when I am asleep have I any rest from them. At times, by the very motions of my body, the thoughts of my mind are disclosed, nor can I restrain the utterances of unguarded words. For a long time thou, like many others, hast been deceived by my simulation, so as to mistake hypocrisy for religion, and thus strongly commending thyself to our prayers, what I expect from me thou demandest from me, do not, I beseech thee, presume so highly of me, nor cease by praying to assist me. Do not deem me healed, nor withdraw the grace of thy medicine. Cease, I beseech thee, from praise of me, lest thou incur the base mark of adulation and the charge of falsehood. Always, I beseech thee, be fearful for me, rather than place thy trust in me, that I may ever be helped by thy solicitude. But now especially must thou fear when no remedy is left in thee for my incontinence. I wish not that exhorting me to virtue and provoking me to fight, thou say strength is made perfect in weakness. I seek not a crown of victory. It is enough for me to avoid danger. It is safer to avoid danger than to engage in battle. I confess my weakness. I wish not to fight in the hope of victory lest peradventure I lose the victory. 
to Eloise, his dearly beloved sister in Christ, Abelard, her brother, in the same. If since our conversion from the world to God, I have not yet written thee any word of comfort or exhortation, it must be ascribed not to my negligence, but to thy prudence, in which always I greatly trust. For I did not suppose it to be necessary to her on whom divine grace has abundantly bestowed all things needful, so that both by words and by examples thou art able to teach the erring, to comfort the weak, to exhort the lukewarm, as thou art long since wont to do when under the abyss thou didst obtain the priorship. But to leave now out of account the sacrosanct congregation of your college in which the devotion of so many virgins and widows bears the yoke of the Lord, let me come now to thee alone, whose great sanctity I doubt not is effectual before the Lord. Nor do I doubt that thou art bound to do all that thou canst for me above all men, especially when I am laboring the toils of such great adversity. Remember, therefore, always in thy prayers him who is specially thine, and so much the more confidently watch in prayer as thou dost recognize it to be more righteous and accordingly more acceptable to him to whom prayer is made. Listen, I beseech thee, with the ear of thy heart, to what thou hast heard so often with thy bodily ear. It is written in the Proverbs, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And again, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Thou knowest, beloved, what hours of charity in my presence your convent was aforetime wont to exhibit in prayer. But now, when I am absent, there is all the more need of your suffrage for me, in that I am fast bound by the anxiety of a greater peril. Beseeching you, therefore, I demand, and demanding beseech that I may find, now that I am absent, how far your true charity embraces the absent, by your adding this form of proper prayer at the conclusion of each hour. Save thy servant, O my God, whose hope is in thee, Send him, Lord, help from thy sanctuary, and watch over him from Sion. Be unto him, O Lord, a tower of strength from the face of his enemy. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. God, who through thy servant has been pleased to gather thy handmaids together in thy name, we beseech thee that thou would protect him from all adversity and restore him in safety to thy handmaids. And if the Lord should deliver me into the hands of mine enemies, so that they prevail over me and slay me, by whatsoever chance I may go the way of all flesh while absent from you, wheresoever I beseech you, my body, either exposed or buried, may lie, have it brought to your cemetery, where our daughters, nay, sisters in Christ, seeing every day our sepulchre, may be encouraged to pour out prayer more fully for me to the Lord. Nor do I think there is a fitter place for Christian burial among any of the faithful than among women devoted to Christ. Women they were, who solicitous for the sepulchre of the Lord Jesus Christ, came to it with precious ointments, and went before and followed, diligently watching about his sepulchre, and bewailing with tears the death of the bridegroom, as it is written, The women, sitting over against the sepulchre and weeping, lamented the Lord. And there, before his resurrection, they were comforted by the apparition and speech of an angel, and thereafter were found worthy to taste the joy of his resurrection, he appearing to them twice, and to touch him with their hands. Live, prosper, and thy sisters too with thee. Live, but in Christ be mindful. Pray of me. To the Bride of Christ, the servant of the same. If by the mention of the perils in which I labor, or of the death which I fear I have distressed you, it was done at thine exhortation, nay, adjuration. Why therefore dost thou complain that I have made you partners in my anxiety, when thou didst by adjuration compel me. 
Did it behove thee in so great a desperation of life, whereby I am tormented to rejoice? Cease, I beseech thee, from saying such things, and forbear from complaints of this sort, which are worlds apart from the bowels of charity. Nor wilt thou, if thou truly love me, find this provision odious. Nay, rather, if thou hadst any hope of divine mercy towards me, so much the more wouldst thou wish me to be set free from the hardships of this life, as thou seest them to be more intolerable. Thou at least knowest that whoso may deliver me from this life will snatch me from the greatest torments. What I shall hereafter incur is uncertain, but from what I shall be absolved is in no question. But I approve thy reproval of praise because in this thou showest thyself to be the more praiseworthy. May it be so in thy heart as in thy writing. If it be so, thine is true humility, nor will it vanish away at our words. But see, I beseech thee, lest in this very matter thou be seeking praise when thou seemst to be fleeing it, and reprove that with thy mouth which thou desirest in thy heart, such cunning also in the wanton Galatea Virgil describes who, what she desired, drew after her by flight, and by the faint of a repulse, incited her lover more hotly towards her. And she flies to the willows, he says, and wishes first to be seen. And this we say because it often occurs, not because we suspect such things of thee, but being in no doubt as to thy humility. It now remains for us to come to that old and assiduous complaint on thy part, that namely wherein thou rather presumest to accuse God for the manner of our conversion than seekest to glorify him as is fitting. Since thou seekest to please me in all things, as thou professest, in this one thing at least, that thou mayst not torment me, nay, that thou mayst supremely please me, lay aside this bitterness, wherewith neither canst thou please me nor attain with me to blessedness. Wilt thou endure my proceeding thither without thee, I whom thou dost profess thy willingness to follow to the Vulcanian fires? Neither grieve that thou art the cause of so great a good, for which thou needst not doubt that thou wert principally created by God. Yet, that in this way we may mitigate the bitterness of this grief, we shall show that it befell us as justly as profitably and that God was avenged more righteously upon the wedded than upon the fornicators. Thou knowest that after the pact of our marriage, when thou didst retire to Argentoy with the nuns in cloister, I, on a certain day, did come to thee privily to visit thee. And what with the intemperance of my desire then wrought with thee, even in a certain part of the refectory itself, since we had no place elsewhere to, we might repair. Thou knowest, I say, how shamelessly we then acted in so hallowed a place, and one consecrated to the most holy virgin, which all other shameful acts apart must be a token of a far more dire punishment. Need I recall our earlier fornications and the most shameful pollutions which preceded our marriage? Or shall I then recall my supreme betrayal, whereby I turned away from thee thine uncle? with whom I was living constantly in his own house. Who would not consider that I was justly betrayed by him whom so shamelessly I myself had first betrayed? Thou knowest also how, when I carried thee pregnant to mine own country, thou didst put on the sacred habit and feign thyself to be a nun, and by such a pretense irreverently cousin the religion which now thou holdest. Wherefore, consider how fitly to that religion divine justice, nay grace, has led thee against thy will, which thou wert not afraid, cousin, wishing thee to expiate in the same habit the profanation that thou hadst made of it, and that the truth of the event shall furnish a remedy for the lie of thy pretense and correct the falsehood. Take heed, therefore, take heed, beloved, with what drawnets of his mercy from the depths of this so perilous sea the Lord has fished us up, and from the gullet of what a Charybdis he has saved our shipwrecked, albeit unwilling, souls, so that each of us may fitly break out in that cry, Yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Think and think again in what dangers we were placed, and from what dangers the Lord plucked us out. 
and repeat always with the utmost thanksgiving what things the Lord has done for our soul. How prudently he has made use of the evil also, that the most just injury to one part of my body might heal two souls. For of thy salvation also the Lord is not unmindful, nay, he is most mindful of thee, and by a sort of holy presage of his name mark thee down to be especially his, to wit, when he called thee Eloise, after his own name, which is Elohim. And by this, that a little while before this befell us, he had bound us mutually by the indissoluble law of the nuptial sacrament, when I desired to retain thee, beloved, beyond measure for myself for all time. Nay, when he was already preparing to convert us both to himself by these means. For if thou hadst not been joined to me already in matrimony, easily on my withdrawal from the world, either at the suggestion of thy kindred, or in thy relish for carnal pleasures, thou mightst have clung to the world. See, therefore, how solicitous the Lord was for us, as though he were reserving for us some great ends, as though he were indignant or grieved that those talents of literary knowledge which he had entrusted to us both should not be dispensed to the glory of his name. The talent of thy prudence, what usury it returns daily to the Lord, who hast already borne many spiritual daughters to the Lord. Oh, how detestable a loss, how lamentable a misfortune, if given over to the filthiness of carnal pleasures, thou wert to bring forth a few children with pain for the world, who now are delivered of a numerous progeny with exaltation for heaven. Nor wouldst thou then be more than a woman who now transcendest men even, and has turned the curse of Eve to the blessing of Mary. Have compassion upon him who suffered willingly for thy redemption, and look with compunction upon him who was crucified for thee. He truly loved thee, and not I. My love, which involved each of us in sin, is to be called concupiscence, not love. I satisfied my wretched desires in thee, and this was all that I loved. For thee, thou sayest, I have suffered, and peradventure that is true but rather through thee, and that unwillingly. Not from love of thee, but by compulsion of myself. Neither for thy salvation, but for thy grief. But he for thy salvation, he for thee, of his own will suffered, who by his suffering heals all sickness, takes away all suffering. In him I beseech thee, not in me, be thy whole devotion, thy whole compassion, thy whole compunction. Grieve for the iniquity of such cruelty perpetrated upon one so innocent. Weep for thy saviour, not for thy seducer. For thy redeemer, not for thy defiler. For the Lord dead for thee, not the servant living. We are one in Christ. One flesh by the law of matrimony. Whatsoever is thine cannot I consider but be mine also. But thine is Christ, for thou art become his bride. I have studied to compose a prayer which he may repeat as suppliants for me to the Lord and send it to thee. God, who from the first beginning of the human creation, with woman form from the river man, did sanctify the great sacrament of the nuptial bond, and who has raised marriage to the greatest honor as well by being born of a virgin given in marriage as by the first of thy miracles, and for the incontinence of my frailty, when it please thee, hast aforetime granted this remedy, despise not the prayer of thine handmaid, which for mine own excesses and those of my beloved in the sight of thy majesty I pour forth in supplication. Pardon, O most bountiful, nay, bounty itself, Pardon our so great offences, and may the ineffable immensity of thy mercy make trial of the multitude of our faults. Punish, I beseech thee, in this world the guilty, that thou mayst spare them in the world to come. Punish for the time, punish not in eternity. Take to thy servants the rod of correction, not the sword of wrath. Afflict our flesh, that thou mayst preserve our souls. Be a purifier not an avenger, bountiful rather than just, the merciful Father, not the austere Lord. 
Prove us, O Lord, and try us, as the prophet asks thee of himself, as though to say, first, examine my strength, and according thereto, moderate the burden of temptations. Thou hast joined us together, O Lord, and thou hast put us asunder when it pleased thee, and in the manner that pleased thee. Now, O Lord, what thou hast mercifully begun, most mercifully finished, and these whom thou hast divided one from another once upon earth, join perennially to thyself in heaven. Our hope, our portion, our expectation, our comfort. Lord, who art blessed, world without end. Amen. Farewell in Christ, Bride of Christ. In Christ, farewell and in Christ dwell.